Happy Sunday, OC. Hello, Patrick Chappelle here. Welcome to Family Matters. We still have no Emily. She is still traveling the West. Emily, we miss you. We cannot wait to have you back. We miss you. We hope that you and Joe are enjoying your time away, but we're excited to have you back here next week at Family Matters. I know you miss Emily. I miss Emily. So we're going to be excited to have her back, but let's get us right to all of the happenings here at Otter Creek so you can enjoy some wonderful worship this morning. First things first, you know what's coming, folks. We say this every week, and we love saying it because it's awesome, but share this link. Share the link. Share on Facebook, on YouTube, on the send the website link to people. Share it to any of your friends, neighbors, co-workers. Invite them into the worship that we are about to bear witness to this morning. Come on, folks. It's going to be amazing. Definitely share it. Also, um, let me remind you about all our service times, okay? So right now we have 840 that is here in person and online, of course, but 840 service, mass required. Then we have a 10 a.m. outdoor worship that is masked optional, but that service, of course, is geared towards our children and teens and their families but seriously people everyone is welcome young old single empty nest or whatever it is you are welcome to the outdoor worship it is mask optional it is outside and it is at 10 a.m then we have the 11 a.m service here in person and online but of course in person it is mass required so those are all your service options make sure that you find a way to connect with us whether online or in person we just love to see you and and uh, hear from you so definitely keep engaging and keep inviting others to come and be a part of this wonderful experience uh together okay next thing we have going on is so we have classes we have some classes that are happening here uh, in person and on Zoom. We have two happening in person, one inside the building, that is mask required, and one in the pavilion, that's mask optional, and then we have a Zoom class. So here are your class options. Definitely check those out. Those are also recorded. So if you are if you can't make it or you're or you got other obligations, make sure you catch it on the podcast, and we would love for you to continue to engage with us in this way. Okay, another update. Starting soon, starting Wednesday, we have Vespers coming back. I know we got a lot of Vesper folks out there, and some of you are like, what is Vespers? Well, people, it's a contemplative service that is put on here at Otter Creek, and we want to invite you to be a part of that. It's Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. at the Memorial Garden here at Otter Creek. And that Memorial Garden is in the north uh, parking lot right by um, all the parking lots and beautiful trees. It's a wonderful area, but 7.30 a.m. or a.m. No, please, don't, do not come at 7.30 a.m. Come at 7.30 p.m. for Vespers at the Remora Garden. It's going to be a wonderful time. Okay, next thing we have is the blood drive. Blood drive, blood drive, blood drive. People, you know, Otter Creek, we, we got that good blood here. It's some good blood in this community, and I love that we are all about sharing our blood with others and helping our community. So definitely sign up for the blood drive because we're all in this together. I love that phrase. It's so great. But go to our uh, redcross.org, sponsor code Otter Creek, October 4th. It's going to be a great time. We always sell this out. So let's keep going with supporting the blood drive. Another event happening on October 4th is Hope Wins for Exile International. This is a wonderful ministry partner here at Otter Creek. The Exile International is working with uh, children who are formal uh, child soldiers who are helping to restore them, give them education, help them with art therapy. It's a wonderful ministry, and they're doing their big event, Hope Wins Digital, here at Otter Creek. We'll be broadcasting here from Otter Creek on October 4th at 6 p.m. Definitely want to check that out. If you are unaware of Exile International, what a great time. Set a reminder and make sure to tune in on October the 4th for Hope Wins with Exile International. And then the last thing I'll share with you before we get you to worship is, folks, it happened. It is official. We are now OC Brentwood and OC West End, one church, two locations. Look at this. We look like a, a, a boy band reunion from the 90s. This is an odd boy band, but here we are outside on the front steps of OC West End. I'm excited to be the campus minister of this wonderful new location 
Y'all, we're going to do some amazing kingdom things at OC West End, and I can't wait for you to be a part of it. And I just, I'm excited to see what God's going to do with this, uh, with this new church location in Nashville, Tennessee. It's going to truly be an amazing, an amazing time. Now, as we build momentum to our official kickoff in 2021, early 2021, we're going to have an outdoor worship service on October 11th. It's going to be great. We're praying for beautiful weather, and we would love to see some of you all join us on October 11th at OC West End at 10 a.m. Okay, folks, that's all I have for you this uh, day on Sunday. We did it. Welcome to worship. Let's all stand and worship God together. Let's give God our praise today. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son,
shall reign forever and ever. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. Praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. By his hand we stand in victory, and by his name we overcome. Praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. By his hand victory and by his name we overcome and by his name we overcome your light broke through my night restored exceeding joy your grace fell like the rain desert live, you have turned my morning into dancing, you have turned my sorrow into joy, you have turned my morning into dancing, you have turned sorrow into joy. Your hand lifted me up. I stand on higher ground. Your praise rose in my heart and made this valley sing. You have turned my morning into dancing. You my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. This is how we overcome. Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even the young will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High 
will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust him. O sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and earth by your strong hand and powerful arm. Nothing, nothing is too hard for you. Good morning, Otter Creek. I'm J.B. Angus, Jr. You can call me J.B. or you can call me Angus. Either one works with me. Angus is what I'm used to. J.B. is what I'm used to. So as long as it's anything within the name spectrum, we're good. I'm your new community life minister here at Otter Creek, and I am so happy to be joining the staff and to be joining this great team of fellow ministers. This is just going to be a great great endeavor and great journey, and I'm just blessed by God that he brought me here to you all, that I might serve you in this capacity. And now we come to our communion time. I'm glad to be sharing this with you once again. Communion is one of the great staples of who we are as Christians. And table time, the time that we come together and that we eat with the resurrected Jesus is the one of the most important times, at least I know for me it is. Because in this moment, even when I've been downtrodden during the week, in this moment I realize the victory is still won in Christ Jesus. Because at the table, it brings me into remembrance of all things that he did just to come to save you, you and I. He gave up his glory. He disrobed of it, came to this world. He put on flesh. He walked among us. Despite everything we were and everything we did, Christ saw more in us than we saw in ourselves. So in that victory moment of what he conquered, going through all of that, he beat back biases and everything else just to continue to love on us, even when some may have even dishonored him, may have disrespected him, may have even disavowed him in some places. 
Christ continued to love them. Even when he was stretched down that cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. This is the Lord we serve. A Christ that is able to get past all of the nastiness that we have put towards him. Because he can replace that with life. He can replace that with love. He can replace that with the light of the world that we shine out on everybody. So that's why we come to the table. We come here in this solemn moment, in this moment of time and reflection and even celebration. Because in this moment, we know the victory is won. In this moment, we are more than conquerors. We are children of God. In this moment, Christ does great things in our lives. So at this time, please bow with me while we pray over our communion. Father God, thank you for this great day. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this time. Father, thank you for your presence that is in our lives each and every day. Father God, we ask you that you continue to bless each and every one of us under the sound of our voices and this, and this broadcast. Father God, continue to reach where we cannot reach and to continue to take us where we have never thought we'd ever go. Father, use us to our full capability and forever keep us in a path that we can remember what Jesus has done for us. Father God, we ask you this time to please bless this bread and this blood that was given for our salvation. Father God, let us take with clean hands, pure hearts, ever looking to Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith. Let us all say, Amen. that I love most about Otter Creek is the way that this church serves. This church is full of people that have a heart for serving others and want to love the way that God loves. And throughout this pandemic, 
People that have been in need are impacted more by the things that are going on in the world right now. And that's why I'm so grateful for our ministry partners that we support, like GraceWorks and Green Street Church of Christ, like Tennessee Prison Outreach Ministry and Tennessee Children's Home. These ministries are boots on the ground ministries that are helping people that are in a lot of need right now. And I love getting to partner with them in the work of the kingdom. I'm so grateful for the ways that you as a church support these ministries, not only through your funds, but also through your time and your talents and your prayers. It encourages me daily to have you all reach out to me and say, how can I help? How can I minister to our community? How can I serve those in need? So thank you. Thank you for the ways you love and thank you for the ways that you serve. Will you please pray for the offering with me? Creator God, there is a lot of hurting in our world right now. And we are so grateful that we serve a God who hears the cry of the hurting, that we serve a God who enters into the suffering of humankind to bear witness to it, God. Please give us eyes to see what you see in this world. Give us hearts of courage that we may serve without fear and that we may live just like Jesus. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. For the last three weeks, we've been considering the life of David and what is our responsibility as Jesus people in understanding how the Torah and the Old Testament still speaks to us today. But really, what I've wanted to do this whole series is to get to Jesus. Because as much as I like David and as much as I find his story compelling, I think Jesus is way more interesting than David. So, for, as Jesus people, we read the Torah not just to get to Jesus. We read it on its own merit, right? We love it. We trust it. Because when Paul wrote that all Scripture is inspired, he mostly was thinking about Torah. He was thinking about these stories that we've been reading. But we can't help, as Jesus people, but to find his life more impressive, more illuminating, more convicting, more powerful. So over the last several weeks, I've reminded you that I think David's story is ultimately a tragedy. It's not a hero conquest story. Now, we, we might remember him as a hero because of VBS, but I don't think that's the way the Bible asks us to remember David. I think the scriptures want us to ask, what could have been? What could have been if David had fully surrendered his heart to God instead of living most of his life with a divided heart? And I've said all along that for us as Jesus followers, the great thing about this story is that we realize we are more like David than we are like Jesus. Just like David is more like Saul, he would never admit this, just like David is more like Saul than he is like God, we're more like David than we are like Jesus. We live with divided hearts. We rarely act out of pure motives. And so... What I really, if if I'm just telling the truth, the whole reason I did this series was so I can say what I'm going to say today. (laughs) Thank you for coming the last three weeks. I appreciate it, those of you who've been here. But I think what becomes so fascinating about Jesus is that when you study his life in contrast to David's life, you find him to be absolutely irresistible. Here's what I mean. When the Gospel of Matthew lays out the life of Jesus, Matthew is by far the most Jewish. All four of the Gospels are Jewish. Don't let anybody tell you that. They're all thoroughly soaked in Jewish language and rhetoric and ideas. But Matthew's is the most Jewish of all of them. That's why he starts with a very Jewish 
genealogy at the beginning. Matthew is setting us up to know that Jesus is the better David. Why? Because Matthew wasn't first writing to us. He was first writing to Jews in the first century who revered the name of David over every other name except for Yahweh. So when Matthew wants to convince people, you should investigate Jesus, you should seriously give him your attention and your affection, he's going to go to the most known person in Torah and say, you think he's important, Jesus is way better. And so what I want to do for a few moments is just contrast the way that Jesus lived his life versus the way David lived his. And my challenge to you is I think some of us sometimes settle for a David life more than a Jesus life. Like, well, we're just happy to be in the arena, like in Scripture. But what Scripture wants you to do is come as close to the life of Jesus as you can. To say his name, to specifically wrestle with the details of his life, to shed some of these generic religious slogans that we've grown up with, like the big guy upstairs and the Lord, the Lord, but to talk specifically about the name and the life of Jesus. That's the whole reason the church exists. So, Jesus understood the trappings of wealth in a way David could not understand. Their stories are really opposites in this way. If you take a colossal, celestial view of Jesus' life, he trades all of it. He trades all the riches of heaven and all of the angels for simplicity in a barn, in a cave in Nazareth. He is a riches to rags story. And you would think that when he goes public and he starts healing people and he wants to impress people, that then he would be like the fake prince in Aladdin and say, Genie, give me three wishes so I can impress all of these people. But that's not what Jesus does throughout his entire life. He stays true to his roots. He lives a life of simplicity. David has humble origins, but he becomes all-powerful. He has this massive living facility in Jerusalem. He dies in infancy. Infamy. Jesus is a riches to rag story from Nazareth, a town of less than 500 people. It was mostly known for the way it supplied the next biggest town, Sepphoris, with men who could provide construction ability, skill. We cannot ignore the intentional decision of Jesus to live a simple life. And some of you came to church today, or some of you are watching online with us, hoping to hear from God. And maybe for some of you, the word of God is, you've got too much stuff. And you're worried about all the wrong things. See, Jesus is this amazing example of how freedom is connected to simplicity. And the more you simplify your life, your stuff your commitments, your desires, the more you boil it all down and make it simple, the more free you are to have a heart for God. But some of us have hearts all twisted and contorted and complicated because we have too many affections, too many allegiances, too many things that consume our time. But Jesus is the better David, and he shows us that the path of simplicity is what it looks like to live a beautiful life. Now, this is the easiest one of all of them, okay? Jesus also had a healthy understanding of friendship and relationship in a way that David does not exhibit. Outside of Jonathan, does David know how to love? Does he know how to view people beyond what they can offer him in his political quests? Rabbi David Wolpe says this about David. David has a range of important relationships that make up not only his story, but Israel's history, and almost all of them are marked by some wreckage or despair. And yet, people who get closer to Jesus get set free. People who spend time with Jesus believe more of themselves. People who get closer to Jesus have a bigger vision for their life. They feel loved, they feel affirmed, they feel empowered. People who get closer to David, their life just gets more complicated. I've got to say this to some of us, right? If you look around and there's drama in all of your friendships, you are the common denominator. 
Jesus brought peace to people. Jesus brought clarity to people. Jesus brought hope to people. David comes off in the Torah as an opportunist, but Jesus says, I welcome whoever wants to. If you're rich and you work for the other team like Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house because I got nothing but love. If you're poor and sick and demon-possessed and invisible, Jesus says, I've got the same love for you as well. And I just want to ask, if you scroll through your text from this week, if you think about who you've had dinner with over the last six months or 12 months, is your friend circle is as diverse as Jesus is? And one of the things that grieves my heart about the witness of the church, this isn't just Otter Creek, this is the church in America, is that our friend circles don't look like Jesus' friend circles. And I'm just telling the truth when I'm really honest and I think about all the different people who make up our churches. I don't see us not only sharing life with the same kinds of people that Jesus shared life with. I don't even see a desire because if you have the desire, it will happen. See, this is the incredible thing about Jesus. It's not that Jesus just woke up in the morning and said, I want to reach out to people who are lonely. I want to reach out to people who are invisible. Those people were attracted to Jesus. There was something about him that they said, I want to get closer to him. And if we are living such a life where we're only surrounded by people who look just like us, that is not a Jesus-shaped life. David seems to have surrounded himself with people who could help him accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. But the Jesus life says, we exist for others. A third way that Jesus is better than David. Jesus was wide awake to the temptations of sex and lust. And I remind you of this Bible passage that I've heard very few youth ministers ever talk about this. But this is what the writer of Hebrews says. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who in every respect, some of your translations say every way, every manner, has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Now we've talked about this a lot with Jesus baptized, taken to the desert by the Holy Spirit. He's tested by God, tempted by Satan, right? God tests us in order to make us stronger. Satan tempts us in order to destroy us. And sometimes we go through things in life and we're like, was that God or was that Satan? And the answer isn't one or the other. The answer is yes. It depends what you do with it. If it made you stronger, if it made you more aware of your weaknesses and how God was calling you to be, then it was from God as a test. But if it destroys you, if it takes you down, it was a temptation. David could not resist the lusts of his heart. Just think about, for instance, the way Jesus treats women versus the way David treated Bathsheba and, in some cases, Michael. There are a list of women named in Luke 8, for instance. They all, well, at least Luke seems to indicate they've been healed of something. In Luke 8, he says there's Mary Magdalene, there's Joanna, who is connected to Herod directly through her husband, who is the chief steward. He's like the chief of staff. And there's the, then there's Susanna, who, whom we know almost nothing about. But these women felt so empowered and so encouraged by Jesus that they opened up their checkbook to help him to keep doing his ministry. See, how we treat people, especially how we treat people of the opposite sex, is part of the way that we demonstrate our love for God. In American culture right now, it is prophetic and countercultural to show honor and respect to people of the opposite sex. It's too common in our culture for women to get together and propagate all these stereotypes about men and all these things that men aren't good at. And it's common for men to do the same thing that annoys them about women and to list all of these stereotypes. What we're really doing in those kinds of conversations and those kind of anecdotes is we're dehumanizing each other. But what I love about Jesus and the way that he interacts with women, whether it's a woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8 or a woman that he meets in a conversation going out of his way in John chapter 4 is when women come close to Jesus, they have a different vision for their life after they meet him. And it's a vision for their life that has been nurtured and stewarded and empowered in love and affirmation. 
It's not about power. It's not about control. It's not about manipulation. It's not being served. It's about flourishing. And Jesus was so intentional in the way that he engaged women. Jesus used his power for the flourishing of others. I think this is such a powerful time in the life of churches right now to remember this. When Paul is writing about Jesus from prison in Philippians, he says, Do not, Jesus did not regard equality as something to be grasped, but rather he emptied himself. He gave himself even to the point of death, death on a cross. See, we are signs of the future kingdom of God. We are literally tokens of heaven. We're like little foreshadows, little previews from the main film to show people this is what it's like. And every single person in this room has some measure of power, some measure of influence. And the example of Jesus, in contrast to David, begs us to look at how we use our power for others. Do we use it 90% for ourselves and 10% for others? Or do we use it mostly for others and some for self? This is what's so great about the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis says this all-powerful God who speaks worlds into existence just by his voice. He can cut the Grand Canyon and paint the sky blue. Genesis says, but this God doesn't just create for God's self this This God creates because he has love in his heart. He has beauty. He has an artist's imagination. It's not just for God so that God can get pleasure. It's that he delights in seeing others flourish. This is why he comes close to Adam and Eve in the garden. He says, who told you? Who told you that you could eat from that tree? Jesus was also very different from David in this regard. Jesus was radically committed to nonviolence. This is so interesting to think about. Why doesn't David get to fulfill his destiny as the final constructor of the temple? Well, 1 Chronicles tells us this. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed too much blood and you've waged great wars. You shall not build a house to my name because you have shed so much blood in my sight on the earth. For those of you who get a chance to go to Israel with us, we're going to go to the Temple Mount if it's a good day and the Jordanian government allows us to do it. We're going to go to the Temple Mount. We're going to stand up there where the Dome of the Rock is, and you're going to feel the tension between Islam and Christianity and Judaism, and we're going to talk about that contested space. See, in June of 1967 in the Seven Days War, Israel had regained the Temple Mount. And they went to the top rabbis of the day in the late 1960s. And they said, the military officials went to the rabbis. And they said, we have finally taken back the temple. Because there were still some people who wanted to rebuild a temple. The temple doesn't actually stand today, if you understand how this works. And the rabbis came back to them and said, you cannot take the holy place by, by bloodshed. This is what we learned from David's life. There is a deep justice component to the heart of God. So the rabbis were living out of this tradition in First Chronicles, not realizing necessarily how beautiful the example of Jesus would be. See, Jesus says some crazy stuff, you guys. Jesus says things like, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called children of God. What good is it if you only love those who love you? Then he says, don't even the pagans do that? (laughs) Then, of course, hanging on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus had so many opportunities to respond in kind. But because violence didn't live in his heart, violence didn't live in his speech. And because violence didn't live in Jesus' speech, Violence doesn't live in his actions. And because violence doesn't live in his actions, it doesn't live in his legacy. This is why when other men and women who have come along and say, how do we create real change in the world? Like real kingdom change where people see the future of God's heaven and we bring it to earth. How do we do it? So many of those people, even non-Christians, have said, you've got to do it the way Jesus did it, through the discipline of nonviolence. Consider how Dr. King describes this. He says, violence merely increases hate. 
Returning violence for violence multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So when the church sees these fringe movements on the extremes of the political spectrum inciting violence all over the United States, including in our city a few months ago, the church can remind people this is not the best way forward. We are committed to nonviolence, not because it's just a strategy, but because in Jesus we see the manifestation of the power of God that love is the most powerful force in the world. And sometimes when people say, oh, you talk about nonviolence, that hippie stuff, that's so weak. Have you ever tried to be nonviolent? You gotta be really tough not to fight back, especially if you've been wronged. And yet the church can say to these extreme movements stoked by our politicians on both sides of the debate and argument, There is a better way to build cities and not destroy. There is a better way to bring about human flourishing. See, Jesus took on violence as an innocent person, ending the idea of redemptive violence. Jesus took it all on to say, you guys have tried this for centuries. It doesn't work. Only love ultimately works. David could not have imagined a world where love was more powerful than violence. And I would suggest that the reason we sing songs to Jesus and not to David is because Jesus was right. It is a harder path. It is a more difficult path, but it is a path that leads directly to the heart of God. See, church, there's only one king that can save us. And it's not George W. Bush, it's not Donald Trump, it's not Bill Clinton, it's not Barack Obama. And to be fair to David, he never claimed to be the Messiah. Now, he thought highly of himself, but he didn't think that highly of himself. There's only one king that can save the world, and his name is Jesus. And he was committed to simplicity. He was committed to friendship. He was committed to purity. He was committed to using his power for others, and he was radically committed to nonviolence. That's who we worship. That's whose cross you put around your neck. That's whose picture you hang from your wall. And it's time for the church to meet him again for the first time. This is Jesus, and this is the Lord of our story. And the whole church said, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go in the power of God, the friendship of Jesus and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You are loved.